I'll try that again with my mic on. Anyone want to say wow? wow. God is here. Amen? Amen. Give him praise this morning. <clears throat> Take your Bible and turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I don't know if you're familiar with the Wellington River. But the Wellington River feeds into the Niagara Falls and the Niagara River. And along the Wellington River, there's actually a sign that says this. Do you have an anchor? And do you know how to use it? As we prayed towards and looked towards this service this morning, we planned for the Lord's Supper and we planned to pray as a church because in these days, we believe with all of our hearts that what we really need is to be reminded that we have an anchor for our soul. And the anchor for our soul is the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. The fact is that many are in danger of drifting. In Hebrews chapter 2, the Bible says we need to remember what we have learned lest we be in danger of drifting. In Hebrews chapter 6 and in verses 19 and 20, the scripture says, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Someone once said that a definition for drift is a slow and steady departure from the truth caused by not being fastened to a mooring. Now, an anchor is a device that ships use, you well know this, to keep them from drifting. Now, I want to encourage us today that what we're going to see in the ordinances of the church is that God intends for the ordinances of the church, which I'm going to explain in just a moment, to be anchors for our soul that remind us of the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this day where there are so many things pushing and pulling on your life, driving for your attention, it is critical that you and I not get distracted that we not get diverted and that we not drift and that we do not allow the dangers of the day to overwhelm us because our hope is fixed and our hope is sure. The ordinances are important. What are the ordinances? The ordinances refer to baptism and the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper and baptism are visible reminders of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baptism and the Lord's Supper keep us anchored to the hope of the gospel. Baptism is a one-time event that signifies something very, very important. First of all, it signifies identification with Christ. Secondly, it signifies initiation into the Christian faith. And third, it signifies entrance into the Christian church. Now, I share that because the church has two ordinances. The word ordinance carries with it the idea of command. We believe that the New Testament makes it very clear that 
that there are two commands that are to be carried out by the church corporately that helps the church to see the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ visibly. Now, when I use the word gospel, I'm referring to the good news of Jesus Christ that Paul says in writing to the Corinthians, I delivered unto you as of first importance that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he rose again. This is the gospel that I have preached to you. And the ordinances of the church are commands that we are given to display that truth of the gospel. Every person who comes to saving faith in Jesus Christ is commanded to be baptized as an outward testimony of their saving faith in Jesus Christ. I want to ask you, have you been biblically baptized by following Christ after your conversion to identify, not so that you can be saved, but as a visible testimony to the saving grace of God at work in your life, have you followed Jesus Christ in believer's baptism? Christian baptism is the immersion of a believer in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is an act of obedience symbolizing the believer's faith in a crucified, buried, and risen Savior. The believer's death to sin, the burial of the old life, and the resurrection to walk in newness of life in Jesus Christ. The Lord's Supper is repeatable. And the Lord's Supper being repeatable is intended for signifying specific things. The Lord's Supper is a rite which Christ established for the church to obediently practice as a commemoration of his death. It is an act of worship that enables us to meet with Christ. Now, when I say that the Lord's Supper is ongoing, repeatable, Jesus said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do this in remembrance of me. What does it signify? First of all, it signifies fellowship with Christ. Secondly, the Lord's Supper signifies continuance In the Christian faith, when you gather and you partake of the Lord's Supper with God's people, you are indicating outwardly that I believe, I am continuing to believe, I am continuing to grow in my faith. But it also signifies unity within the Christian church. Now today, what I want to say to you is this, that the ordinances of the church serve to help remind us of the anchor for our soul, which is the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there is no saving grace in partaking of the Lord's Supper, meaning because you partake of these elements, it doesn't make you a Christian. But there is a spiritual significance of partaking of the Lord's Supper. I want to answer a couple of quick questions. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you six things that the Lord's Supper does and how it anchors your soul in the hope of the gospel. First of all, who can participate in the Lord's Supper? The Lord's Supper is an act of corporate worship for those who believe in Jesus. In other words, it's for the church. The Lord's Supper is an act of the gathered family of those who believe in Jesus, the church. We don't forbid the taking of the Lord's Supper to someone in a nursing home or a hospital, but that kind of individual celebration is exceptional. It is not the biblical norm. Five times in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks about the church coming together when the Lord's Supper is eaten. Now, what is the sequence? The sequence always seems to be in the New Testament that baptism precedes communion. Now, what do I mean by that? Nowhere in the New Testament does it appear that unbaptized believers partook of the Lord's Supper. Uh, People came to saving faith, they were baptized, and then they followed in participation as a continuance of the commands of Christ. They've been baptized, and now they were following Him in participation in the Lord's Supper. Who can participate in the Lord's Supper? Christians. But it's also Christians who are not living in serious sin. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 
The Bible reminds us that we must examine ourselves. And if you look in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 29, the Bible says, for he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. Now, in no way does the Bible say that you have to be perfect to partake of the Lord's Supper. There is a difference in all of us who are saved by grace, who struggle with sin areas in our life, versus the person who is living in blatant sin and says, I disregard what God says, I don't care, but I'm still going to partake of the Lord's Supper. That's a dangerous thing, amen? Who can participate in the Lord's Supper? Christians. So let's ask the question, how does the Lord's Supper anchor our soul? The Lord's Supper anchors our soul by providing seven things. First of all, it is a reminder of God's redemptive plan throughout history. Now, when you look to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and Paul writes to us, and he says, beginning in verse 23, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now, if you were to read each of the gospel narratives, you would well remember that Jesus had entered into Jerusalem to partake of the Passover meal. And a part of the Passover meal was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Go all the way back to Exodus chapter 12 when God was preparing to deliver his people out of bondage and slavery in the land of Egypt. Remember that in the Bible, Egypt is representative of the wilderness of sin. Being in bondage in Egypt was symbolic of people being bound up in their sin. In the Old Testament, when God delivered his people out of Egypt, it was a foreglimmering and a type of the ultimate deliverance that would be ours from our sin. Leaven represented sin. And in the Old Testament, when you get to Exodus chapter 12, and then you get to Exodus chapter 24 and 25, when the people of God had been commanded to commemorate God's passing over them and delivering them out of Egyptian bondage, they were to eat unleavened bread in haste because God was delivering them out of the bondage and slavery of Egypt. When Jesus comes to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover meal, he then turns the Passover meal into what we commonly call communion or the Lord's Supper. And he reveals to us that it is a continuance of a reminder that God has been working throughout human history to redeem for himself a people to himself and that the provision for salvation does not come from man, but it comes completely from God. Isn't that good news? So as we partake of the Lord's Supper, it's not just some exercise, some religious activity that we do. It becomes an anchor for the soul that reminds us of the hope that we have in Christ and that God who we love and who we serve has been working throughout all of human history to redeem a people for himself. You know what's interesting? After the Passover meal was established, the tabernacle was erected and later the temple would be built, you know that the construction of the temple involved what would be called the outer court, the inner court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. And in the holy of holies is where the high priest would go once a year to enter into the very presence of the living God. But all along the way from the holy place to the holy of holies, there were pieces of furniture, there was an altar, there was a table, and there was on that table what we commonly call the bread of presence, the showbread. There were 12 loaves representing the 12 tribes of Israel. But the table 
upon which the bread was placed, the bread of presence. As a matter of fact, in Exodus chapter 25, it's literally called the bread of presence. It was a continual reminder of the presence of the living God among the midst of his people. Jesus said, I am what? The bread of life. Jesus promised his followers, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. As we partake of the Lord's Supper, this is not just a religious ritual. It is an anchor for our soul that reminds us that God has been working his redemptive plan throughout history to bring a people unto himself. It's also a powerful reminder of our forgiveness. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and in verse 25. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. All throughout scripture, we know that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. And, and when we partake of the elements of the Lord's Supper, when we partake of the bread, which reminds us of the body of Christ, when we drink the cup, which reminds us of the spilt blood of Christ, we know that it is the atoning work of Jesus Christ and the fact that he shed his blood to pay the penalty for our sin that we are reminded that the anchor of our soul is the hope that we have in Christ. We don't hope in ourselves. We don't hope that we're going to be good enough one day. Our hope is in Christ and the satisfaction that he provided for our sins. Isn't this good news? The Lord's Supper anchors our soul by providing a powerful reminder of our forgiveness. I don't, I don't know about you, but every day I need to be reminded that God forgives. Are there any other sinners in this place? Third, the Lord's Supper anchors our soul by providing a source of spiritual nourishment. If you were to read verses 23 through 26, it's interesting because it reminds us that Christ is here with us. Now, there's three terms that I want to share with you. One is transubstantiation. This is the view of the Catholic Church that believes that when you partake of the elements, they literally become the blood and the flesh of Christ. We do not believe that. We don't believe it's found in Scripture. Uh, there are those along the Lutheran line that believe in what's called consubstantiation. They do not believe that the elements uh, become the literal body and blood of Jesus, but that the body and blood of Jesus is with, trans meaning change, con meaning with. They believe that the uh, Lord's uh, physical presence is with the elements. The third word is memorial. That is, that the Lord's Supper is a symbol that memorializes his death, his burial, and reminds us of his resurrection. We believe the scripture says that this Lord's Supper is a memorial. But while we believe it is a memorial and that it is an ordinance, not a sacrament, in other words, receiving these elements don't give you grace, that the participation in the Lord's Supper is a means of spiritual nourishment to your soul. Why? Because anything that you and I can do that would tether us to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and remind us of where our hope really lies nourishes and feeds us spiritually. Can I say something to you? I am going to say something to you. 
In these days, when everyone is thinking that our hope is elsewhere and found in other things, I want to remind you and I who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that the hope that we have is more sure than anything in this life, and it is the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. Let us bind ourselves, let us anchor ourselves to the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord's Supper is a source of spiritual nourishment. One writer said, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we feast spiritually by faith on all the promises of God bought by the blood of Jesus. Next, the Lord's Supper anchors our soul by providing a visible proclamation of the gospel. That's what verses 24 and 25 are telling us. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are the gospel made visible to the church. Fifth, the Lord's Supper anchors our soul by providing a reminder of the Lord's return. Look in verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until what? He comes. Not if he comes, but when he comes. Jesus Christ is coming again. But the Lord's Supper anchors our soul by providing, finally, an opportunity for self-examination. Notice verse 28. A man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. It seems like our whole world is teetering and tottering. For all the old people in the room, weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. Do you remember that? (laughs) If you're young and don't know what I was talking about, just ask somebody with gray hair. They can tell you. (laughs) But it seems like people are struggling to find solid ground in their life. But for you and I who believe and know the Lord Jesus Christ with all of the winds and all of the waves that are ebbing and flowing and blowing all around us, our hope is fixed and the anchor holds. And when we come together and partake of the Lord's Supper today, it's an opportunity for each and every one of us to examine ourselves and say, Lord, Make sure that I am not drifting from you. The Lord's Supper is an anchor for the soul. I want to ask you to bow your heads this morning. In a moment, we're going to sing a song called Living Hope. This morning, our invitation into the Lord's Supper is a little different in that this invitation, there will be a pastor in the balcony, there's going to be a pastor here on the floor. And it may be this morning that from where you are for the first time in a long time, you want to get up and you want to come to this altar and you want to cry out to God on behalf of our nation. This week is a big week in the life of our nation. But our hope is not what happens Tuesday. Our hope is Christ. Amen? Amen. And it may be that you need to come and pray at this altar. It may be that you need to come to a pastor and say, you know, I've heard what Daryl said this morning. I've never followed Christ in obedience and believer's baptism. I'd like to talk with someone about what that means. And we'll follow up with you. Maybe today you just want to come and and kneel at the altar and say, God, you really are my hope. Prepare my heart as I get ready to partake of the elements. I don't know what God's going to do this morning, but oh, that the altar would be filled with people hungry, thirsty, desiring to tether themselves to the hope of the gospel. Father, I'm asking that as we sing, you would be glorified and that we would respond.
I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.